Hi, thanks for listening today to my talk on securing React Native apps against API abuse. My name is Skip Hofsmith, and I work at a company called Critical Blue on a security service called Approve. Approve works by authenticating mobile apps integrity and secures API calls from those mobile apps. I actually started off my career as a chip designer and worked my way up the abstraction stack ever since. Besides chips, I've worked on hardware accelerators, reconfigurable FPGAs, and embedded systems. Android OS optimization and hardware security modules as well, before finally kind of embracing the cloud in mobile applications. A common theme for me is optimization. For example, I worked on tools for hardware software co-synthesis and automated software parallelization. Parallelization, that's a dangerous word to say, parallelization. It's easy to instead hear parallelization, and I did indeed parallelize a few systems along the way. Hopefully that won't happen today. The objectives for today's talk are for, to give you an appreciation for how React Native apps themselves um, can be exploited for uh, API abuse. We're going to do that by following a chain of exploits to try and give you a feel for the types of attacks you're going to see and the kinds of defenses you can mount against those attacks. And finally, at the end of the talk, I'll give you a link to some work scenarios, all the scenarios we showed today, uh, plus some additional stories so you can go ahead and go deeper. You'll have access to all the source code so you can go as deep as you want. APIs these days are everywhere. I'm sure everybody knows that. Um, in 2018, Akame did a study on their secure CDN traffic. Uh, they looked back for uh, sort of similar traffic back in 2014, and then uh, requests for APIs on this network were less than 50% of the traffic they saw. By 2018, over that same time period, it was up over 83%. So the use of APIs had really skyrocketed. And during that same a uh, six-month time frame in 2018, over 27 billion credential abuse attempts uh, were on just that secure network alone. Um, they ranged again the from retail into video, entertainment, financial systems, um, across the map. APIs are in use, and they clearly are a very uh, desirable and fat target for hackers to get into back-end systems. If you're on a mobile app, uh, whether it's React Native or anything else, you're going to be relying on APIs for most of the traffic. Unlike a traditional browser, which kind of serves up pages, which are a mix of UI um, and data, uh, on a mobile app, the UI is pretty much baked in along with most of the business logic, and really the application is requesting back-end data to be served up to it back and forth, and oftentimes more data than it may need. Um, because it may be using that data over many different uh, page, page equivalent type views. Um, additionally, if you're using an API technique such as REST, um, you're going to be trying very hard to make your API call stateless, which makes it even easier for attackers once they have an understanding of what an API call looks like. They can use it by itself without having to work really hard to set up a bunch of extra conditions ahead of time or, or using things afterwards to extract data that they may have triggered. So much easier, uh, much more structured um, in using the kind of, these kinds of APIs. So how would a hacker go about abusing APIs um, through a, a mobile app or a React Native mobile app? Well, the first thing they're going to want to do is they're going to want to try and understand how the API works. So they're going to work hard to reverse engineer it. If you're working with a public-facing API, you, uh, you probably already have access to documentation that explains quite well what that API calling structure and protocol looks like. Uh, but if you're on a private, uh, private type uh, API, what you're going to want to be doing is doing your best to sort of protect anyone from seeing what that looks like. Um, so the first thing the attacker is going to do is try and reverse engineer that app. Along the way, they're going to try and gather or generate some user uh, access credentials and possibly API keys extracted so that they can uh, go ahead and make these uh, API calls. Then they're most likely going to uh, build up a botnet and launch some very high volume attacks calling all those APIs. As we saw in the last slide, credential stuffing is very hard, uh, very popular, trying to extract as many user uh, information and user credentials as possible. You can also make API calls to try and extract personal information and excess uh, data that comes with API calls. Um, you can use legitimate looking API calls to make uh, application level denial of service attacks where you're tying up key resources on what look like a legitimate API calls. They can get all the way to the API backend, um, but they really are just designed to lock up the system. Um, if you can use these APIs to get access into a system, you can both collect data and you can manipulate whatever is behind the system as well. Um, and sort of one of the most common ways, which is not necessarily a malicious way to use uh, API attacks, is service aggregation. 
Um, one example would be a, a financial app that uh, tries to give the user a uniform picture of all the different banking institutions they're banking at. So the user will maybe surrender their credentials, give those access to the service aggregator. In turn, they'll be able to get a good picture of all their finances, but also what they've done along the way is given up that information so that the aggregator can then um, probe much more information on all those back-end institutions um, and potentially sort of take eyeballs away from those institutions themselves. There are really kind of four attack surfaces I tend to look at in this mobile application API space. The first one is user credentials. Um, that's a pretty well understood area uh, using something like OAuth or OpenID Connect, so I'm not going to focus on that much today. The second attack surface is the application running on the device itself. So this is both statically the application code um, as well as dynamically when it's running in the device environment. Um, once it's left the device, an API call will transit across a channel, and that's certainly a valid attack surface as well. Can we get in and observe the actual API calls in action? And the last attack surface is, is kind of the public or accidental uh, surface, which uh, kind of gets a lot of press. Uh, but if you have a public-facing API, you've published documentation, you may uh, surprisingly publish uh, API keys or protected calls you didn't really want to expose um, in that documentation. Um, and if you have a sort of public-facing uh, uh, Git repo, for example, um, it's not uncommon to accidentally publish uh, credentials and secrets in those repos as well. So how do you defend uh, your API? Your first approach is trying to prevent reverse engineering of those APIs. You want to do everything you can, if it's not a public API, to prevent understanding and observing that API in action. That's a pretty tall order, um, and you have to be pretty perfect to do that. I don't know many applications that actually achieve that. So barring that, the second thing you need to do is make it very hard to construct a valid API call. Um, so when you require user credentials or when you require an API key, um, you're trying to prove some, you know, who is using your app or what is using your app, your API calls, to make them look as, um, as valid as possible and to make them very hard for somebody to, atta to attack unless they've been able to uh, extract those secrets along the way. Um, and you don't have to be perfect. It's unlikely you can be perfect. Um, so whatever you need, you're doing, you need to just make it hard enough that it's really not profitable to, for an attacker to spend their time there, and they will pivot off to another fatter, less secure target to go after. So we're going to use the ShipFast application and ShipRaider, the service that's attacking it, um, for our exploits today. Uh, this is a picture of a ShipFast React Native driver app. Um, it's basically an app where a driver will um, say, hey, I'm available to pick up packages. Um, the ShipFast service will provide it a um, sort of nearest pickup point, um, and it will, the driver will go ahead and drive there, pick it up, um, take it to the destination, and drop it off. The driver will be paid by the distance that the driver drives or the time that it takes to deliver the package. Um, and what's perhaps a little bit unusual in this app is that there's a gratuity that goes with every shipment, and that gratuity is actually um, set by the shipper when they place the order. Um, so some uh, some delivery packages will have high gratuities, some will have zero gratuities, um, and the driver doesn't get much choice in the matter. The ShipFast wants to maximize their throughput, so they're going to assign the nearest shipment regardless of that gratuity, and, and drivers don't necessarily like that. This is what the API sequence looks like for pickup and delivery, and really the key call here is the one that's highlighted in yellow. Um, this is the get nearest shipment call. Um, we're using an API key to identify the app, as well as a standard sort of OAuth to bearer uh, JOT token kind of access token for authorization. Um, so that's provided. And then uh, the latitude and longitude of the driver, uh, the location of their device is used to identify what is the nearest package to that driver uh, when they indicate they're available. So one of the drivers uh, decided they wanted to see if they could get into this API and figure out how could they see where there are the highest gratuity uh, deliveries, not just the ones that are nearest to them. 
Um, so they started uh, hacking into the API and they were able to first do a proof of concept in a web app and then finally bake it into um, a sort of tweaked out version of the app that would enable a driver when they're available to see a, a range of shipments near them that would show them all the different gratuities and enable them to select not necessarily the nearest package, but the one that is going to be most profitable for them. Um, so um, the, the drivers in this case really do like the ability to do this and they'll readily give up things such as their user credentials into this modified app in order to take this advantage. Um, so the exploit that was actually used here uh, focused again on that nearest shipment call. Um, as we can see, when the um, shipment with proper user authorization and API key um, requests the nearest shipment, it gets information back about that shipment for the driver to accept. Um, it includes the latitude and longitude, and all the exploit would do in this case would be to repeatedly loop over this call, um, providing a range of latitudes and longitudes to get a picture of where are the shipments around the driver, um, and they'll get information both on where the start point is as well as the gratuity itself that the driver will then select from. So we're going to move into the React Native Ship Fast Ship Raider battle. Um, we have a reasonable security posture set up here. Uh, there's an app which is going to be using user authentication through OAuth. Um, it's going to be receiving an access token once it, the user credentials are verified. Um, it's going to be making API calls across a uh, TLS secure or AT HTTPS call um, using a single API key back into a backend API server proxy, which I'll talk a little bit about in the future. Um, that proxy in turn will, um, will assemble the information it wants through the range of whatever uh, internal or third-party services are being used. So one big point I want to stress is that user authorization by itself is not service authorization. So in the case of ShipFast and ShipRater, customers will readily give up their user credentials if they think they're going to get something good in return. And in this case, what they're getting um, is the opportunity to get much higher gratuities for each trip they make. Um, so user authentication is an attempt to indicate who is using this API. Uh, but what you really need to focus on and what traditionally is focused on with API keys is identifying what is it that's calling your API. Um, and aggregators that will reverse engineer APIs are basically going to see how can they set up uh, additional who and what kind of information to attack these APIs. There's almost always, and I do strongly recommend that there be strong, reasonable uh, defenses in place at the backend service itself, usually built into API gateways. You'll do rate and resource limiting to try and make sure calls aren't uh, coming too fast or that they're not uh, using too much of their high value uh, resources. Uh, you can do this also in a behavioral sense by examining some of the data in the API calls themselves. Um, for instance, we could see a, a set of calls looking for nearest shipments from the same driver with different latitudes and longitudes calculate the velocity the driver would have to be driving to get from point A to point B to point C um, and pretty much conclude they're going way too fast for reality. Um, you can bake these kind of resource checks and data checks uh, automatically into um, calling pattern anomalies using uh, deep learning kind of techniques, AI techniques, um, to train a system to recognize these kind of anomalies. Um, they biggest challenge with all these systems is uh, they're statistical based, so they don't give you a firm yes or no answer, um, and therefore it's possible, uh, it, the tighter you make these constraints, the more uh, false positives you're going to see. We're actually potentially going to be rejecting legitimate customer usage of your APIs. So most of the time, uh, these kinds of uh, rate and resource checks are uh, loosened up to try and make sure that you don't turn away any legitimate users, and uh, by extension, you're allowing potentially more malicious users in through this uh, API gateway. Uh, I do strongly recommend um, that you use an API proxy pattern and that with your React Native app, you develop a, uh, a single API uh, between your app and the API proxy server. Um, and then that proxy server itself um, will fan out and um, implement those calls uh, using whatever third-party and internal services you want. 
Um, the main advantages you have here is that you've strongly decoupled the API call between app and server and uh, however you're going to fulfill those API calls. Um, you've taken what could be multiple API keys with multiple services um, and uh, cut that down to one single API uh, key that you're using within the app to service calls. Um, you can readily sort of evolve the back end, switch uh, service providers for your maps, for example, update API keys. You can do all that without touching the back the application uh, that's running. Um, and you can evolve uh, the security, for example, of the APIs between app and API service um, without impacting the back end. Um, so this kind of strong decoupling is good, and I would even recommend that this API uh, calling protocol between app and API service not be the same as your plain uh, web applications if you're running web applications with similar functionality. So uh, let's look at the first attack that's going to be happening on the React Native app. Um, as you know, React Native is uh, enabling you to write your code, uh, much of your code, in JavaScript. Um, and that, in turn, goes across a React Native bridge. Um, and those JavaScript calls are being fulfilled um, in the back end uh, native modules. So you'll be making UI requests, networking requests, other platform requests. Um, initiated from the JavaScript layer, traveling back into the native layer uh, where they're fulfilled. Um, so you have one um, JavaScript bundle in either Android or iOS um, that contains all the JavaScript code. So the first thing that any hacker is going to do is they're going to start with that JavaScript bundle. Um, they're going to unzip it and unminify it and take a look at what's there. Um, is this code in any way um, protected? So um, right off the bat, what we see here is that there's been no obfuscation done in this code. Um, so you can unzip it and take a look at it, and you can clearly read the API key constant there, um, as well as you see the code that actually assembles the API calls here. Um, so you're getting both the strings as well as what additional parameters are being used in those API calls. Um, so right off the bat here, pretty easy attack to extract both the API key as well as the API uh, calls themselves. So your first defense is going to be to obfuscate this code. Um, so you're going to be trying to um, hide the secrets in the code um, as well as to blur out any kind of business logic to try and make it more difficult to follow the control flow of the application. Um, and there are various uh, extensions you can add into this obfuscation, as well as knobs you can turn to make the obfuscation more and more difficult to understand. When you turn those knobs up too extreme, um, you'll start costing the, uh, the cost of actually deobfuscating on the fly in the runtime will grow, um, and the performance of the application overall may start to slow. So you need to find a balance there between how obscure, how much obfuscation you're going to be doing um, versus the kind of changes in performance that you're willing to, uh, to put up with. Um, so I'll be recommending some um, free, uh, freely available packages throughout the talk. Um, so I would start with the JavaScript obfuscator package. It gives you a good broad range of uh, techniques that you can use in obfuscation. Um, I've taken and used that tool on the original unobfuscated code and just set the knobs very, very lightly. Um, so if you look down here on the right, you see that we started to cut up some of the strings into smaller pieces. Um, as you uh, increase the, uh, the knobs here for strings, you'll start to see them also be encrypted so they're not as easily uh, uh, just gathered by doing a simple sort of strings examination of the code. Um, and, um, and we're starting to cut up all the, the string assembly uh, as well for those API calls. So if you've obscured the code uh, strongly enough, um, then the attacker is going to pivot most likely off the device and take a look in the channel between the application and the uh, backend uh, service that's being called. Um, so usually um, all API calls are going to be TLS-based, uh, and that security will encrypt the channel, um, which is always a very important thing to do to make sure that it's not easy to observe. But unfortunately, um, one of the advantages that the attacker has is that they are in full control of the device that the application is running on. Um, so a very typical way to launch a man-in-the-middle type attack would be to um, go ahead and generate a fake TLS uh, certificate that says, trust me, I am the back-end service. 
um, and I will take that certificate. And because I control the device, I'll install it, install it in the operating systems trust store um, so that when the application actually makes a call, um, I will respond as the man in the middle with this TLS certificate and the operating system will say, yes, it's acceptable to trust the certificate um, and it will enable me to establish a, an encrypted channel between the app and myself, which I can easily decrypt, um, as well as I can either um, observe and pass that on to the backend channel or I can manipulate these calls uh, along the way. So um, that's uh, a very common second attack. The way to counteract that attack is uh, typically through certificate pinning. Um, and here, because we can't trust the device that the application is running on, we're going to sort of set up an application-specific uh, trust store, so a trust store within the application itself, a list of uh, just the few certificates that I'm expecting to see from the back end. Um, you can pin the certificates themselves, or you can pin the public keys held by those certificates. The advantage to pinning public keys is that um, more than one certificate can be used um, to protect the same public key signature. Um, there is support for pinning certificates in many native networking stacks. For React Native on Android, for example, OKHTTP OK is the native stack that's being used, and there is a certificate pinner uh, support there. One of the biggest issues about pinning and why no, I think not enough people do it is there's a concern about the maintenance of certificate pinning. And I'm sure you've heard of uh, services that have gone down uh, because a certificate has expired uh, over time. Um, so there's a concern that if a certificate expires, the, the application will not be able to contact the back end um, and may not even be able to get the, an updated certificate because it can't make a valid connection. Um, and that will require a user to sort of back out and, um, and use the App Store to get an entirely new or updated app installed. Um, so uh, let's assume that the attacker is, uh, has um, in, launched a man-in-the-middle attack, and um, now we're going to have to uh, pin the channel to, uh, to defend it. There are a couple different ways you can go about this. Um, I've shown just here at the top how to generate a public key fingerprint, um, and I've recommended two packages here you can take a look at. Uh, the first one, React Native SSL pinning, um, pins uh, within the JavaScript stack itself. Um, so it actually takes the typical fetch call uh, and augments it with additional pinning information. So if you want to use this uh, technique, you're going to have to go in and at each API calling site, you're going to have to augment your calls themselves. Alternatively is the React Native Cert Pinner uh, uh, NPM package that you can look at. Um, and here, the um, pinning actually takes place within the native networking layers themselves. Um, so in, in this case, there's absolutely no impact to the JavaScript. Um, you're just making normal fetch calls, um, and all the pinning is taking place down lower within the native um, code itself. The advantage to that is that those can be quite well hidden uh, within the native domain. The, the disadvantage, perhaps, in this technique is that it is um, less dynamic. Um, so when you install and set up these pins, um, if you need to update or change these pins, you may be forced to trigger a relaunch of the device in order to, uh, to have them uh, be pinned when the device first picks up. And that's different from what takes place in the native JavaScript uh, layer, where these pins can be changed between calls, potentially, if you wanted to. So the attacker is going to uh, get frustrated that it's not easy to do a man-in-the-middle attack to observe your API calls. Um, so their next step is to go about trying to unpin the channel. Um, and the common techniques that's used for that is to go ahead and install an instrumentation framework on the device. Um, these instrumentation frameworks are typically used during debugging of applications uh, where you're trying to tune, say, performance. Um, and they enable you to get in and sort of hook function calls, add additional instrumentation, count function call sequences, and, and such. So great advantage for debuggers trying to optimize your, your uh, applications, um, but also very great tools for attackers to learn more about your application and to sort of manipulate it during actual runtime. So the steps here would be to uh, go ahead and root or jailbreak your device, install a instrumentation framework here. I'm showing Frida, which is a very popular framework. Um, and you're going to be looking to 
hook the call that says, am I properly pinned? Uh, and replace that with just a, a function that's going to always report, yes, I'm perfectly well pinned, you're good to go. Um, so you do that um, by, in Frida's case, there are actually a, a number of public scripts that you can take a look at and adapt to your own circumstance. Um, if you've obfuscated the code, um, you may not be able to as easily recognize some of the function names themselves, so you're going to start a certain amount of trial and effort to identify the calling signatures, um, and if you can narrow in on the signatures that are being called, those are the functions you'll target or replace. And obviously, there'll be functions that have similar signatures, so you'll, you'll go through a, a bit of trial and error until you get the right ones there. An alternative, if you don't want to unpin the device itself, would be to go in and try and actually monkey patch the fetch calls themselves, um, whether they're the raw fetch calls that were being used with the um, cert pinner package or whether you're looking at the augmented fetch calls with the other package. Um, either way, you can potentially hook those functions completely and replace them with an entirely different network stack. So how do you defend against this? Well, the first uh, and best defense is trying to block the rooting or jailbreaking of your devices. Um, so try and make sure that your app will not work if it detects that um, there's been any kind of rooting going on. Uh, additionally, if you don't uh, identify rooting, you can also look through actual uh, um, operation and memory maps to try and see if you can see sig signatures that indicate that instrumentation packages do seem to be on the device and running. So for React Native, you can use a package uh, such as the NPM package jail monkey, uh, and this will, uh, it's implemented natively, but this will give you information about whether it believes that the device is jailbroken or rooted, um, and you can uh, use this as a first line of defense against blocking these kind of techniques. Um, because they're just native packages, um, these packages potentially are vulnerable to monkey patching, um, and uh, their signatures are very plain, so at least you have that going for you. If you can turn up the obfuscation, they're a little bit harder to recognize. So if you have successfully blocked the uh, unpinning here, now you have uh, a highly obfuscated application. Uh, when the attacker pivoted over to the channel, um, you've pinned the channel, so they've been frustrated trying to observe what's going on there in the channel, um, and you might find uh, that you're going to be uh, attacked by a source you didn't expect, which would be your very own product manager. Um, and it's been our uh, experience that many product managers are very nervous about certificate pinning. Um, so you may get a product manager who comes in and say, I I'm not going to allow any possibility of breaking my app, um, so I'm going to disallow any certificate pinning. So at this point, you've lost um, your best defense here currently against uh, uh, encrypting and securing that channel. So what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to pivot and move up the abstraction stack and see if you can um, encrypt or at least detect any kind of tampering uh, occurring uh, at the application level uh, of the messages that are being passed back and forth. Um, so in this case, we're going to use a somewhat ad hoc technique where we're just going to uh, take an API call, um, and we're going to uh, add a secret uh, for signing uh, messages to the app. Um, we're going to assemble a message from the API call itself, and a little bit of entropy. It's not the best entropy in the world, but you might take the access token, for example, for the user authorization. Assemble a message from those two, and then uh, sign it with an HMAC algorithm using the secret that's you now stored on the device. Um, you're going to pass that, that secret across. This is not encrypting the call in this example, but what it's doing is trying to ensure that the call itself has not been manipulated in any way. Um, the backend service will receive the API call, uh, will assemble the message from the components, um, and will go ahead and use the same secret, which it knows, uh, run it through the HMAC calculation and verify that the HMAC signature that it expects is what actually came through in the header SFHMAC. Um, one of the best uh, features of this type of technique is that the secret itself is not present in the channel, um, so you can't observe or steal that secret as you might if you were able to see, say, the API key um, within this channel. Um, but the, uh, the cost here, um, actually there are several costs. The one cost is that you've added another static secret similar to an API key into your application, so you're going to have to think about how do you protect that, um, as well as 
you are using TLS, which is doing some encryption, and you are then adding an, another additional application layer, uh, which might involve encryption as well. So um, you're doing uh, additional processing for each API call that's going through. So since you've added yet another application secret um, into the application package, um, you should ask yourself, what can I do to protect or remove that secret from the application? Um, so one thing you can do is you can attempt to remove the secret from the app bundle itself, from the code that's being downloaded. Um, the typical approach for doing this would be to uh, download or add the secret, uh, not in the package itself when the package is downloaded, but when the application is first used. So you may make a, uh, an insecure call um, typically known as trust on first use, um, or you may do something such as require the user um, to uh, accept a test message to see a verification code and type that into the application itself. And once you have that, it's no longer in the bundle, it is in the runtime. Um, you're going to want to secure this uh, between usages, so you're going to use some sort of secure storage. Um, there are quite a number of different secure storage packages for React Native, um, so you can take a look at the React Native keychain package um, to use. It's quite good at encrypting and storing key value pairs. Um, so the secret is in the clear in the runtime, but it's no longer in the bundle, and when it is at rest, it hopefully is in an encrypted state. So now the attacker is going to take a look at this, and they're going to have to do a little bit of detective work to try and uncover what is becoming more of an ad hoc approach to security. Um, because now you've uh, gotten rid of the pinning protection, um, the uh, attacker is free to use a man-in-the-middle type attack to be able to inspect the API calls that are occurring. Um, when they do this, they'll see that what's changed is there's now an HMAC header. Um, they can pretty much guess from the fact that you're using the term HMAC in your um, header that it's a, um, a hashing um, authentication code algorithm. They'll guess SHA-3256, for example. Um, so they're going to go ahead and uh, root the phone um, and see what can they find um, and can they get a hold of this in the code itself. Um, if they can't find it in the secure store, if they can't break into the secure store, then they're going to perhaps try and uh, launch a debugger into the runtime environment. Remember, they do control the device. Um, and can they see, uh, run it up and pause the application right when the HMAC secret has been extracted from secure storage where they can see it and, um, and perhaps potentially wander through and understand the algorithm that's being used as well. So um, you can continue to improve your defenses. There's going to be a bit of a back and forth. Um, we're becoming more ad hoc in our approaches, which means it's going to cost more in development um, to put these kind of uh, techniques in place. There's more chance for error. Um, but it also being ad hoc does add some new challenges to the hacker as well. Um, you're going to want to do your best, for instance, to try and prevent uh, applications being allowed to run into buggers. Um, you're going to continue to try and improve the root and jailbreaking detection. Um, hackers are continually looking for new ways to cloak any kind of rooting and jailbreaking activities they use. Um, so you're also going to have to make sure that you have a very uh, good way to uh, periodically upgrade uh, the application. For example, if the JailMonkey package um, improves over time, you're going to want to be able to install a new and improved JailMonkey package into your application as easily and as transparently to the user as possible. Um, you're going to continue to kind of dial up the obfuscation if you see that that's a weak point in your application as much as you can without costing you in, in performance or energy usage. Um, you can uh, add to the obfuscation um, not just obfuscating the code, but start adding in the ability to detect whether this package has been tampered with in any way. You can sort of add checks of the code to make sure it's there. You can add false paths. You can add timing checks to make sure that um, certain sequences of activities haven't been changed in any way. Um, and you can continue to play these types of games, trading the, the security levels that you're trying to achieve for the performance uh, limitations that you might encounter. 
So another uh, approach that is a little bit more structured is to see, can we take the secrets and more importantly, the security decisions that were made on the device that might be hooked and changed, can we move uh, those off the device? Um, so do a little bit of indirection here. The more we can get off the device, the more secrets there are off the device, the less there is to steal. Um, the more that we can make security decisions off the device, the less that you have the ability to hook in and overturn those security decisions. Um, so let's just posit here that there's some sort of secrets or application authentication service. And when an app is ready to make an API call, um, rather than uh, just go ahead and uh, with their best protection, make the API call, throw in the secrets, do the calculations locally. Um, what it will do is call up to this authentication and secret service and request to be attested. Can you make the decision for me? Am I clean? Am I running in a safe environment? Has the code been tampered with in any way? Um, and so you can have a, a protocol set up between them where the uh, backend authorization service is going to go ahead um, and take some measurements on the device, analyze those measurements, and uh, analogous to user authorization is going to in issue some sort of uh, short-lived token that's going to be able to um, either be signed by a secret known by your backend service um, if it believes that the application is valid and healthy, or it will just simply have a bad signature sending through so that token is uh, invalid. Um, in that case, the application will get a token, and interestingly, it won't know whether the decision has been made good or bad. Uh, it will simply take that token, just as it would for a user access token, ship that with the API call to the backend service. The backend service will then examine the signature of this um, of this token, um, just like it's checking the user access token, and hopefully it's identifying both the who and the what appear to be valid in these API calls. As I said, these tokens themselves can be very short-lived. Unlike user authentication, there's no human in the loop, so you can do this fairly frequently. So you could potentially do it every API call, or you could do it on the order of uh, minutes if you wanted to, um, to just continually to, to check and make sure that this application hasn't been tampered with in any way or that the device hasn't been rooted since the last time we made a check. So this is what a sort of proof of concept implementation of this looks like. There's nothing that I know of currently in the um, NPM package environment, um, but you can uh, imagine that you have a, an application with an attestation API that's embedded into an SDK. Um, you're going to want to harden that SDK um, by using the techniques we've talked about, such as obfuscation. Um, and you're going to go ahead and crank those up pretty high. You're not cranking everything across the entire app, but you're really focusing on building a very secure uh, set of function calls as well as the, uh, the channel used to communicate with the backend attestation service. Um, so the, the application, before it makes an API call, is going to request that it be attested. It's going to ask, essentially, for an authorization token. Um, that'll go over to the attestation service. The attestation service is likely going to reply with some sort of challenge, including a nonce just to salt the measurements that are being taken and, and to try and prevent replay attacks. Um, and in this simple proof of concept, the application is going to respond by creating a hash of the signature of the package. Um, so in this case, we're really looking at um, has the code changed in any way? Um, so it would be the signature plus hashed with the nonce itself. Um, and that measurement would be passed back to the attestation service. Um, if you wanted to improve the security here, you would start also adding additional sort of runtime safety checks. So you would be making measurements about whether the device is rooted or not, uh, examining memory maps, uh, potentially trying different function calls to see has the environment uh, been tampered with in any way. Uh, but as I said, in this case, we're just looking at the package signature. We'll pass that hash with the nonce back to the attestation service. The attestation service will evaluate those responses based on what it expects from an untampered application. Um, and if it's healthy, it will send back a signed, uh, properly signed token. If it's unhealthy, it will send back a uh, improperly signed JWT token. 
Uh, it's important to notice here that monkey patching uh, is not going to be effective here because you need a valid token from this service in order to successfully complete the API call. Um, so you do need to run through this attestation service to get a successfully signed token. Um, and if you try and patch the function calls themselves, um, that would change the package signature. So when you do the measurement, um, then you would not get the expected result and you would end up with a faulty token, um, which would not enable you to complete the API call when you add that to the API call going to the back end. So at this point, if you've truly hardened that, that SDK, just focused on that, that very specific set of functions and that specific channel, um, then it might be, a re, be appropriate to reintroduce the pinning service at this point. Um, so once you have the secure channel, you can exploit it, and um, pinning is a good way to do that. So you can imagine sort of setting up a private pinning service um, that allows you to actually ship these, um, seek these certificates um, rather than using a sort of uh, unprotected tofu uh, type approach of requiring the user to key in a verification code, um, you could simply attest that the app looks like it's clean, untampered, and in a healthy environment. At that point, you could send uh, pinning certificates down to the application. Um, if you wanted to rotate those certificates or if you wanted to update them over time, you could use the same channel and protocol um, to keep all those certificates up to date. Um, so you're free to change those as well as to change the secret that you're using for signing this. Um, and none of that, since there's no secrets uh, relying on the in the application itself, none of those uh, uh, can be extracted by uh, doing whatever you can do um, to attack the application. So this kind of app authorization service and private pinning package could well be integrated into something such as that React Native sort of certificate pinner package uh, that we discussed earlier. So just to summarize here, um, we set out with uh, a number of defense objectives. The first one was to prevent API reverse engineering. Um, one of the best ways to, uh, to do that on the device itself is to obfuscate the code so the code can't be easily disassembled and understood. We used pinning techniques um, and then eventually the um, sort of application level uh, prevention techniques to try and secure that channel. Um, went back to pinning once we had uh, the secure attestation channel. Um, in the second step here, we wanted to make sure that it was hard to construct a valid API call. Um, and the remote attestation where we were able to take as much of the security responsibility off the device as possible was probably the best technique uh, to use here. We've added now a new uh, token. Um, there's no longer a secret on the device itself. Um, and so that's helped pinning again to make it hard to see and to potentially manipulate what's going through that channel is obviously important. Runtime defenses, um, you really need to uh, work on trying to prevent rooting or, uh, or jailbreaking, and this is a game you're going to have to be playing over time or delegating to someone such as JailMonkey, who hopefully will be updating those defenses over time. Uh, bottom line though, you just need to make it hard enough that it's not worth the hacker to spend their time on your uh, API calls, they're too well protected, versus what they see uh, across other valuable targets they might choose to go after. Um, so you will have to evolve your security approaches over time because uh, the industry as a whole will be uh, improving over time and you need to stay slightly ahead uh, to make your target the least attractive that you can. So if we've been successful here, then uh, you're, you will not be caught by a bear in this case because you have evolved your cert your security and stayed ahead of the game. So going back to our objectives, I hope I did give you a bit of an appreciation for how React Native apps are open to API abuse. Um, and by following that sort of back and forth chain of exploits, it'll give you an idea of what these kind of attacks that you saw, different from just kind of credential stuffing, trying to steal uh, and reuse credentials, but more uh, at uh, how your attacker is going to try and get at understanding the API and manipulating and abusing that API through. Um, as I promised, we will provide to you uh, these scenarios worked out in code, so you can build and analyze these as well, as well as hopefully a few more stories, um, and we'll be adding to these stories over time. So to access that source code and uh, all the stories, uh, just head over to approved.io slash battle. And I do uh, want to thank you today for uh, bearing with me through to the end. 
I do love questions, so please, if there's anything you didn't understand or wanted to clarify or any new suggestions or stories you might have to improve the presentation or uh, the uh, ship fast ship raider battle itself, please do reach out to me um, and I'd be glad to help in whatever way I can. And please stay safe. Thank you very much.